This is Queen City Fame, where we put the Q in Queen and the F in Fame. The home of the Superboy Hamburger. The place where Willie James began working as a car hop 65 years ago. And the best fast food in town. I'm talking about South 21. And we have the owner of South 21 Brookshire Boulevard, Mr. Johnny Catapotis. Hi, Johnny. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for having us here in your Absolutely. diner. Thank you for having me. So who is Johnny Catapotis? Johnny's a, I would say, a determined, confident, hardworking person with a heart of gold. So you're Greek, right? Yes. So how did your family land here in Charlotte? So my parents, uh, like a lot of other Greek immigrants back then, were just fighting poverty in Greece and came here for a better life opportunity so their kids can have a better life than what they had. So my dad actually had some relatives um, here in the United States, in New York, Chicago, and Charlotte, somehow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so when uh, my dad and his brothers came over here, um, they all brought them to Charlotte, because at that time it was just a small city, and, 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 and it was just a lot of good opportunity for them to, mm -hmm. to start a life here. So, how'd you get in the restaurant industry? Because your parents came here, and then what happened next? <laughs> well, that's the, the, the funny thing is, like most immigrants, you know, they, they, they go to restaurant business. And that's why a lot of Greeks have restaurants today, because they started in working in restaurants, and they just worked their way up and got their own. Right. The funny thing with my parents is my dad was actually a tailor. My mom was a seamstress. So they started an alteration business. <laughs> okay. So my family never had no restaurant whatsoever. My immediate family. Okay. Um, and I was never planning on going into restaurant business. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents' goal for me was to get the education they didn't have. That's right. And have the suit and tie behind the desk job. Mm -hmm. That was their idea of being successful. Right. Um, and I was at CPCC take some classes and I was getting ready to transfer to the University of South Carolina. All right. And uh, it was the summer before I went off to USC and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law's father, let me back up here, my brother-in-law's father and his th two brothers started South 21 back in 1955. Wow. So my sister married into the family. So my brother-in-law at the time was running the one on Independence, the drive-in on Independence. Calls me up and says, hey, what time do you get out of class? Um, I need some help. And I was like, man, I, I've never worked in a restaurant. He goes, my mom's going to Greece for two, two months. Mm -hmm. I just need your help for two months. It's going to be simple. You're just going to work from, with me up front, make some drinks, take some orders. Nothing, nothing more. I said, okay. So I did. I was getting out of class and going there and just giving him a hand. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, I was end up working all summer. I worked some nights. Okay. I would work on fall break and Christmas break. And then when I came home from school for the summer, I found myself working there. And even when I graduated from school and I was doing internships and got my first job, I was still working there part time. So he was holding on to you. So I wouldn't say he was holding on to me. It's just uh, it just worked out for, for both of us. Right. And, um, and and then it just I just never got out of the restaurant business. And then I decided I want to do something on my own. So this opportunity came up. Mm -hmm. But the good thing that what my brother-in-law did for me when I worked for him is he never kept me in one spot all the time. He moved me around, right. you know, the grill and then the deep files and the front. He put me in every aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned that business on the back of my hand. And right. I learned the way South 21 did their thing. So um, this opportunity came for me, it was, came available for me to come here and, and, and do a South 21. So South 21 started years ago, like what did you say, 19? 1955. 1955. Do you know where that name came from? Yes. So my brother-in-law's father, George Copses, and his two brothers, Sam and Nick, opened up the first South 21 in 1955, and it was on South Boulevard. But that road at that time mm -hmm. was called South 21. What? Oh, there's some that history. That was South there's 21. There's some history. Okay. That's South okay. 21. That's how you got back and back and forth, mm -hmm. up and down the East Coast, North and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And when they built I-77, mm -hmm. they changed South 21 to South Boulevard. 
So it. that's where the South 21 came in. South 21 driving. It's the first drive-in in Charlotte. Very first one, 1955. Now, is there a drive-in still anywhere? And there was, and then they built the second one, or they started the second one in 1959 on East Independence, across from Bojangles Coliseum now. Oh yeah, okay. And that's one, st that one's still there and still being operated. Nice. So you opened your restaurant and business was great and. You were like taking trips and traveling the world. I wish. <laughs> this is when it gets interesting. I was looking for a breakfast and lunch place. That's what I wanted to do, breakfast and lunch. And my brother-in-law came to me and says, you know, we're getting complaints from the South 21 on Brookshire. At that time, mm -hmm. this place wasn't part of the family. Mm -hmm. One of the brothers had this as an investment and he allowed other people to use the name South 21. Right. So it changed hands quite a few times. So there was people actually running this location that was outside of the family. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do nothing South 21 the way the it was. The reputation of the South way, Yes, the way it's been done since 1955. Yes. So it, they were getting complaints left and right, mm -hmm. but there was nothing they could do. So my brother-in-law said, go buy them out and bring it back. Bring it back part of the family. Right. And my answer to him was, I don't want a South 21. <laughs> I'm good. I don't want lunch and dinner. I want a breakfast and lunch place. Mm -hmm. And he said, do breakfast and lunch. Do a South 21 with breakfast. Now and you're I, the only one that has... I'm the only one. Only I'm South, the only 21 South 21 that serves breakfast. breakfast. Okay. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you think it would work? And he said, make it work. So I came here and um, I never realized how bad it was. The, it had a real bad reputation. I came in on 2007. So I came here, bought them out, um, remodeled the whole place, um, and no matter how much I pushed and advertised that it's original South 21, I'm part of the original family, mm -hmm. I couldn't get anybody to come in. Nobody wanted to set foot <laughs> place. I mean, it, I, there's been times when I saw customers come in when things started getting better. And I right. could tell they'd been here before because they would walk in and they'll, because it had a new image on the inside. Right. And they would tell me, I swore up and down, I'll never sit for, for in this place again. Ever. And I said, what made you change your mind? And they said, I keep hearing good things about this place. That's a good thing. That's so, a good um, so I struggled with that in 2007. In 2008 came and the economy hit. Tanked. Paint. <laughs> yeah. And I was struggling. I mean, those first two years, I couldn't pay my bills. I mean, I, I made it, I paid enough, I made enough, the restaurant made enough to pay its bills and pay my employees. Right. But there were months that I walked out of here and not even got paid. Or there were, oh, I got one week's paycheck. Oh, wow. And I was working 70 hours a week. So what did you do about that? I mean, <laughs> luckily I was blessed. <laughs> <laughs> I had a father that was able to help me. I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm, I need help. I mm -hmm. can't pay my bills. And he lent me some money to get out of this hole. Mm -hmm. And I was determined to make this thing work. And I started opening Thursday and Friday nights. And Thursday I started Friday opening night. Saturdays. Even I though mean, you wanted even only though breakfast I, yes, and lunch. Yes, I told myself, this is going to be temporarily. But I'm going to make this thing work. Mm -hmm. And um, I just... Every day I came in and I was the first one in, last one out. I worked every day. I put an apron on, I was hands on. And um, slowly but surely, I, I, you I've building. come a long way. Come Let's a put long it way. Well, I've come a long way. So, the restaurant industry is very fast paced, uh, especially during the lunchtime. So, how do you keep track of all the orders? Because you have to get those out quickly. Yeah, we do, because a lot of people just literally have 30 minutes. Somewhere. Exactly. Pick and we pre up. and we prepare everything, cook the order. So, so when you order it, nothing nothing sits. When okay. you order is when we start cooking. Um, we just got a system. Everybody does their job. Right. It's, it's almost like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I do is I'm in the middle of it. I'm in the kitchen. What's your responsibility? I overlook everything. <laughs> I overlook everything. So I'm in the middle. Mm -hmm. I got two cooks on either side of me. I watch them. And I'm able to look out the window and keep an eye on the girls up front, right. customers. I can see every order that comes in and out. I can see who comes in, in and out. Um, so I'm in the middle of everything. And I just, 
I've done it for so long, I just know what needs to be done. I'm very observant. I, I can keep track of everything. So that, that's, that's how I do it here. So you have a lot of regular customers that frequent here. Um, what do you think keeps them coming back besides your Southern hospitality? I stress this all the time with my help. Get to know the regular customers. Yeah. And it's one of the things we do is we find out what their name is. Mm -hmm. And we call them by their first name. And when they come in, we know exactly what they're going to order, mm -hmm. have their drink ready when they come up to the counter. Just little things like that mm -hmm. makes them feel comfortable. I mean, it's a good feeling when you walk in an establishment and, and they know who you name. are. That's true. Um, so we just kind of get to know them on a friendly basis and, and then just being consistent, being mm -hmm. consistent with our product. Tell our viewers how they can find you, how they can follow South 21. Uh, South 21 Berkshire is located on 6116 Berkshire Boulevard and we are on Instagram, South 21 Berkshire. You guys, y'all heard it right here. Uh, this is our show. I want to thank you, Johnny, for allowing us to crash your diner. Oh, thank you for coming. <laughs> this is Queen City Fame, where we put the Q in Queen and the F in Fame. See you next time, guys. This is Queen City Fame, where we put the Q in Queen and the F in Fame. His designs are influenced by painter artist Piet Mondrian, a designer ahead of his time, a visionary through thought and creation, Mr. Gordon Holliday. Hi, Gordon. Hello. So who is Gordon Holliday? Gordon Holliday is a designer, a creative visionary. Um, Somebody who's not afraid to explore. I'd just say a little ahead of his time. A little ahead of his time. You attended the University of North Carolina Greensboro, mm -hmm. pursuing a degree in photography and graphic design. Yes, yes. Not fashion. Not fashion, not fashion design. So, what got you into fashion design? How'd you get there? Yeah, um, well, it really all started from high school. High school uh, was the real kicker of me getting interested into fashion and style. Um, seeing that I came from Baltimore, Maryland, a school, a middle school out there, I had transitioned to ninth grade to um, Mallet Creek High School. And from there, uh, I came from a uniform school to a school where you can now choose whatever outfit you wanted to wear and be fly for. So for the first day of school, of course, I had to put on the best fit that I had in my, in my whole closet for that year, you know? Right. But uh, after that, it just really made me question more because I, I came to school every day and everybody had all these different outfits on, people had a different style, people. It just it just showed me something I was, I never really explored before um, because previously when I was in um, middle school, I was an artist and I was doing a lot of art stuff while I was there. And it, people weren't really worried about what clothes they wear because we all had navy blue shirts and khaki pants. Exactly. Um, so now that I was in a school where I can explore really myself and I was in high school, it was like a coming of age thing. So when I finally graduated, I I actually got nominated for what was it? Four senior superlatives, like best what? best smile. Of course, yes. <laughs> most artistic. Yes. Uh, most fashionable, and most likely to succeed. Wow. But I didn't win any of them. <laughs> so you entered a design competition. It was founded by Terry Melville, yes. uh, the former VP and fashion director for Macy's New York. Mm -hmm. Um, the Beatty Creative Award Competition, what was the first thing that went through your mind when you won not only first place, but second place as well? 
it was a shock. I mean, <laughs> I literally like I like I, when I, I, it was just it was just a crazy experience because I'm sitting down with all the designers and we're both like, wow, you guys did an amazing job. Like I'm looking at uh, the other ladies. I'm just like, wow, like this dress is beautiful. Right. So I'm looking at all these designs and I'm just like, this is just. Fantastic! I, I'm just a, I'm just glad or appreciative <laughs> to be in the energy of all this, you know. Right. So I, I and I'm and I, I, at the end of the day, I was like, if I lose, if I win, like I would still appreciate this experience because I've never done anything like this. I've pushed the boundary mm -hmm. far enough because that was my first women's collection ever. Wow. You know? So I also had to I had to learn about the game, mm -hmm. but then I had to expand on the game. You know exactly. So your concept was future ballerina in thirty thirty. Mm -hmm. So all of those concepts, all of that research got you to the futuristic ballerina. Yeah. So I noticed I've seen a, a couple of photos of that. The ballerina had masks on. Mm -hmm. Where did you come up with that idea? Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I was watching iRobot um, one day and uh, with like Will Smith in there, and I'm just looking at the the face of the robot. Now, you know, it's all like CGI, computer generated, yeah. but uh, I was just staring at it. And I was just like, wow, like look at these like, the way these androids are built, mm -hmm. and I was just like, how cool would it be? <laughs> <laughs> to have like my models look like robots, and I pitched her the idea, and I also pitched my sketches for the for the fashion show, and okay. like she was just like, let's do it, let's get it, <laughs> you know, I wow. love it, you know, and uh, we went forward with that. So we had to bring um, Gordon's inspiration, uh, of course, his mom, uh, Monique Stubbs Hall, <laughs> onto the set. <laughs> uh, we wanted to ask you because you should definitely be proud of this young man. I mean. He knows exactly where he wants to go. He's a visionary. He's ahead of his time. Absolutely. What was the first thing that went through your mind when your son won first and second place in the Betty Creative Award Fashion Competition? Mm -hmm. um, so that was really, it was amazing. And it was amazing for a number of reasons. One, the first thing that went through my mind and his dad's mind was, how is that possible that you can win first place and second place? Um, so once we figured that out, the fact that he had three designs that walked on the runway um, and two of them won, and that it was possible that one designer could win first and second place wow. because both of the two designs won, we were like, wow, this is really awesome. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> I just want to thank you for coming to the set. Well, I can see me. where he gets his style, his beautiful smile <laughs> from his mom. That's where that term comes from. Oh. You know, I get it from my mama. <laughs> here you are. Thank you for being here with us and thank you for sharing. Okay, thank right. you very much. All right. Well, I know that you were um, part of a Think House U fellow. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Think House U was a program UNCG started up where they took um, pretty much entrepreneurs that were all students. You didn't have to go to UNCG. You could have been like in uh, any school, enrolled in any school oh. in the local area. Mm -hmm. And you would pretty much live with uh, four to five other entrepreneurs mm -hmm. all in a house together developing your business. And once I put myself in that environment, I mean, it, it spoke already the, the Terry. I would have never got connected with Terry the way that I had if right. it had not been for that program. What inspired you um, to come up with the name Rule? What does it mean? Yeah, Rule means uh, rule over our lives every day. Yeah. You just came but, up with that just out of the blue. You just woke up out of the bed and yeah. said, I'm ruling over my life every day. Exactly. And um, I think I kind of like had a dream or something, something like that just happened out of the blue. Like something just hit me and I was like, who? over our lives every day. Yeah. That's the acronym. That's what that means. Right. Well, I see a lot of the color block. Now, you got that inspiration from who? Yeah, Mondrian. Yeah, that's where I got it from. Yeah. Uh, and like, I I looked at like a lot of iconic, iconic artwork. Um, just, just looking at just the way people were doing things, like um, Caravaggio, for example, he uses very like dramatic, um, figures and uh, environments to create a story in his paintings. Mm -hmm. So, like in that way, I use dramatic colors. I have a dramatic red, and that's like one of my staple 
colors that are in my pieces because it's red is one of the, the brightest colors on the uh, color spectrum so it grabs your attention that's why there's a stoplight or a stop sign or stop or stop brakes you know it's the first thing that grabs your attention so right. when you walk in a room it's like you're commanding attention because that's you right. have this red so now it's like you got this attention what are you gonna say what are you gonna do you know like people are gonna now watch you and see what you're doing that's the type of uh, positions the clothes like take over a little bit about this. Yeah, so this is uh, another piece from the Love Letter collection that I did. Um, this one was more like a two-tone drawstring hoodie, and I have uh, two hidden pockets. Uh, one pocket right here, the other pocket on this side, and there's I a drawstring, that. yeah, right I in the middle. Uh, this one has the same similar hoodie to that one over here, so it goes right over your head, almost like a tortoise shell, um, with the two drawstrings right here. Just pull. We have what? This jacket, which yep. is such a cool jacket. Look at this, it's like navy blue, and then of course, we see the red. Mm -hmm. I'm greatly inspired by like Japanese culture um, because I was pretty much like an anime type of person, so mm -hmm. I like any like those anime characters. So this is a neoprene duffel bag that I created. Um, and yeah, this is what I use. I use like felt. I was really inspired by the Bape hoodie. Um, Bape is a brand based out of Japan. Yeah. So I was inspired by that and I, and I used the felt that they normally use and, uh -huh. and put that on this duffel bag. Uh, wow. the, the material is neoprene, same as like my pants. And then I added denim to the bottom and a camo tie zipper. Very cool. That's a perfect bag to take to the gym. Right. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about this jacket and this fabric. Yeah, so this is um, a fabric called neoprene. Um, same material like that I made with the pants and um, the duffel bag. Uh, this material is pretty much like a very light, but it also has its own like texture to it. It's like a silky smooth, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I, I do like to use this material uh, in this new collection that I'm making right now, Untitled. Uh, with this collection, yeah, um, I've used a lot of neoprene in it. And uh, this one is more like, just like this kimono, mm -hmm. but I try to find more ways that I could challenge it. So I added um, two pockets that are inside. It's lined with a uh, pink. Oh in wow, the inside. that's cool. Um, it also has like a sleeve pocket. And what I also try to do is play around with the textures. And I added a neoprene mesh on the back as well as a hooded pocket instead of being in the front, being in the back. So all your friends, they can like warm their hands up. Right, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so how would someone be able to find Rule? How would they find you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, my Instagram is Rule.co. So Rule.co. My website is www.rule.co. My Tumblr is www.roulet.tumblr.co. Okay. And then my Twitter is ru at roulet underscore one, two, three. Okay, you guys, you heard it right here. This has been Queen City Fame, where we put the Q in Queen and the F in Fame. Thank you. Are promotional models like we all have our set of friends that are outside of this business mm -hmm. right yeah and then we have the main people that we seem to always work with no matter what well, even if we're not trying to we always yeah. seem to be where each other are so it, it yeah it's, it's, it's kind of we became friends yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because you're outside of this like none of my friends are promotional models yeah and i can't yeah. i can't really see them doing this it's not really like <laughs> yeah. everything so they, they would be yeah. like what yeah my friends yeah. have families and responsibilities <laughs> and they're like um what i gotta constantly look for work i gotta what i gotta you know they need them they're more like stable nine to five <laughs> job, you know, and it's understandable if you have a family, because this um, industry is not for everyone. You definitely have to be a hustler. Yeah, you, yeah. Have to, you gotta go get yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You gotta you go get it. You're contractor, you're your own boss. <laughs> so what do you guys like about um, being promotional model the most? Flexibility. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Flexibility. Absolutely. 
interacting with people, mm-hmm. just meeting different people, hanging out with y'all, and and traveling, time. Time. making so, my own schedule. Yes. You yes. get other opportunities from yeah, you too. Like networking, so is, networking, networking is networking is everything. With mm-hmm. yeah. And I get to control how much money I make. Really? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The harder I hustle, the more money I make. And like you were saying, the networking and it just opens so many doors yes. to amazing things. And not and even outside of marketing, it opens doors. I love representing all the brands. I'm always trying to like, okay, that's a new one. Let me get that one. Let me get that one. Let me get that one. Let me get that. That's like my goal. So you represented over 70 brands. Oh, it's 74. 74 now. I'm count one. I never even thought yep. to do that. 74 yeah. brands. Wow. How do you manage to remember all the product knowledge? Because I, I'm actually a consumer for most some of those brands, right. you know, um, I, or I'm just interested, or I just have an amazing brain. For us to refresh ourselves yeah. at any time, but we usually are repeat workers mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. said brand, right? So it keeps it fresh for us anyway. Do you have difficulty dating when you're a promotional model? So do I think it's hard dating as a promotional model? No, I think dating in general is hard. Being a promotional model is just another thing that I do and with the people that I date, I tell them what I do just like I would tell them anything else about myself and it's never a a problem for me. So in the industry, do you guys think it's important to change your look? Yes. Yeah. I've never changed my look. She is the girl next door. I mean, yeah. you ever like change the color? Yeah. Hair color. Yeah. Hair color. I, normally I change my don't. Look. I normally don't, but I did for a hair show. So hair if they're gonna show. pay me to change my look, I think I'll do it. I yeah. constantly change You're my just look. The chameleon. I am the chameleon. I changed my hair last year around this time. I was completely bald. bald. Uh, last summer I was completely blonde. No one knew it because I always wear wigs. I have, I'm always changing my wigs, even though they be short. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll do like from long to short, or maybe change the hair color, but that's probably about it for me. Depending on the job, or weight you're trying to like, too. <laughs> right, exactly. So you don't want to be too much, or your makeup overdone. If right. you're working this for is a PlayStation, yeah. or is you know, fun. if you're out in the nightlife, you need to have a little pop of red on your lips. You know, stand out from. The average girl. Right, the girls are yeah. larger than her beer. Right, exactly. You know, what advice would you give someone that want to enter this industry or want to build their brand? Because they look up to you guys. If you notice when you enter a room, is everybody's looking? Mm-hmm. What advice would you give someone? The advice I would give someone who wants to build their image and their brand is to utilize social media and all of the different platforms that are out there and also to make sure that you're targeting the right audience for the brand that you want um, to have. For example, if you are a fashion model, you wanna make sure your platforms really speak to the fashion audience. And if you're a promotional model, you may want to um, have your brand speak to different products and and promotional um, audiences. What do you want to have accomplished in five years? The question, where do I see myself in five years, can be difficult for a promotional model to answer. And that's because we can work for any company, anywhere, doing all types of various tasks. I love to get new brands and clients under my belt, as well as work with other agencies. So hopefully after five years, I'll be able to maybe get a thousand of those under my belt. But not only as a promotional model do I like to work for other companies, but I like to also introduce other models to the promotional community. And in doing so, I like to build a team and network of women and men as well so that we can network and work together and find each other jobs. So hopefully I'll be able to network and have a huge group behind me, if not have my own agency within those five years. If there was one thing you would want to change in the world, what would it be? Yeah. People's philosophy, if they can adopt maybe the idea of karma, you know, what you, you put, put out, out, you get back. If everyone could just adopt that philosophy, I feel like the whole world would change. Yeah. Um, empathy. Mm-hmm. I feel like people are getting so desensitized because we get so much information mm-hmm. all the time on our phone and computer and we have our phones. 24-7 and we're scrolling, scrolling, scrolling and it's headlines and videos and things aren't shocking anymore. Like everything they is really so are. normal and you scroll by and it's just like, uh, whatever mm-hmm. and you go back to your day and it didn't used to be like that when we weren't taking in so much information all the time. But that also is a personal choice though because no, we, can, much so. we can always put our phones down. 
Mm. But like she said, like people are so des desensitized because like with the Facebook Live situation where the gentleman got shot on, like it was crazy. But people like talked about it for maybe a split second and moved on to the next thing. Yeah. You know, we're so focused on the, taking a knee versus worrying about, you know, the other multitude of things. Like, it's hatred. No, it is. You know what I mean, we focus on it. It's like it breeds it. It makes it more powerful. Instead of just figuring out how we can love more. So where can um, your fans follow you? Instagram, I'm the Buzz with B. I used to have a blog called the Buzz with B, so the Buzz with the letter B. It's a good blog too. Um, Instagram, Keisha Lorraine. Instagram, Amber dot La L A dot D A Y Day. Amber dot La dot Day on Instagram. Mine is Fabulous Drea, and not like Fabulous the Rapper with the O. It's F A B U L O U S. D-E-R-A. And mine is Danae R. Cipollone. I'm Italian. And you can follow me on Instagram at for Evan Nicole and yes, he's Ebonic. And my Instagram is Jessica, two underscores, and then Celine, C-E-L-I-N-E. Well, we you guys <laughs> heard it right here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and sharing the experience of being a promotional model. Um, I can't say how beautiful you guys are inside and out, because you are. I've had the uh, opportunity to work with each and every one of you guys. So that's the end of our show. Guys, follow these guys here. Um, they're more than just a face. They're more than just a promotional model. So that's our show. This is Queen City Fame, where we put the Q in Queen and the F in Fame. Bye, guys.